what is going on in our brain when we learn new movements? This is the main question that has been driving us over the past decades. Historically, it has been assumed that long-term depression at the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapse in the cerebellum is the main mechanism underlying procedural memory formation. However, over the past few years, we obtained suggestive pieces of evidence that other processes might in fact also contribute to cerebellar memory formation. For example, the granule cells, which form the sole source of the parallel fibers, turn out to be mostly silent. So how is this possible? How would it be possible that long-term depression of the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapse forms the main mechanism underlying cerebellar motor learning if the parallel fibers themselves are silent to begin with? It was then that we decided to make a new mouse model. And it was this mouse model that forms the basis of the current paper on neuron. Potentiation of the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapse can be induced following tetanic stimulation of the parallel fibers. And for this potentiation to be expressed, glutamate receptors have to be inserted in the postsynaptic part of the synapse. The insertion of additional glutamate receptors will make the Purkinje cell more sensitive for the same parallel fiber input. So the question is, how can we block this process? Long-term potentiation at the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapse depends on the phosphatase PP2B, which in effect allows the glutamate receptor subunits to be inserted at the postsynaptic site. So we created a mouse model in which PP2B is blocked specifically inside the Purkinje cell, and we named this mouse L7PP2B. So let's first see what happens with the cellular plasticity in this mouse. When we tested the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell input in the normal control animals, we could clearly see induction of long-term potentiation following tetanic stimulation of the parallel fibers. In the mouse mutant, however, this process was severely affected and we did not get any potentiation whatsoever. In contrast, when we compared the induction of long-term depression, which one can get after combining parallel fiber stimulation with climbing fiber stimulation, we did not see any deficit, neither in the mutants nor in the wild types. So these data demonstrated that we indeed created a mouse mutant in which long-term potentiation was specifically affected in Purkinje cells. So this created the possibility then to test cerebellar motor learning. And for this goal, we subjected the mice to both adaptation of the vestibular ocular reflex and Pavlovian eyelid conditioning. For the adaptation of the vestibular ocular reflex, one first puts the animal on a rotating table in the dark and measures the baseline amplitude of the eye movements. If one moves the table and thereby the head of the mouse to the right, his eyes will automatically move to the left and vice versa. After these baseline measurements, we turn on the light and apply a training protocol for one hour using a mismatch stimulation in which the vestibular and visual stimulation are not aligned as would occur in the normal daily life of the mouse. This means that the animal will perceive a lot of retinal slip, which in turn will trigger the induction of plasticity inside the cerebellum, causing an increase of the amplitude of the eye movement. This increase in the amplitude of the eye movements can still be seen when we return to the baseline measurements in the dark. And this is indeed what we saw in the normal control animals indicated in blue. Over the course of one hour training, the gain of the eye movements was substantially increased. However, when we subjected the mouse mutant without long-term potentiation to this test, indicated in red, we found that these animals were not able to increase their gain. These data suggested that potentiation in Purkinje cells is indeed important for learning in the vestibular cerebellum. But what about other forms of motor learning, controlled by other parts of the cerebellum? Are they also affected? For this reason, we subjected the mutant mice to Pavlovian eyelid conditioning, which is an excellent test for investigating learning-dependent timing. In this test, the animal learns to recognize and condition stimulus such as a tone and to react with an eye blink response after a particular time interval. The length of this interval is determined by the duration between the onset of the tone and the onset of the unconditioned stimulus, which here is an air puff on the eye. 
So an untrained mouse will initially not react to the tone, but he will close his eyelids only after the aircraft comes in. However, after 100 trials or so, he is able to recognize the tone and he will have his eyelids closed just before the aircraft occurs. When we subjected the mutants to this task, we found, indicated here on the left, that they were not as successful in developing conditioned responses as the control animals. Moreover, as indicated here on the right, they also showed deficits in the timing of the few conditioned responses that were still visible. So the mutants also showed significant impairments in Pavlovian eyeblink conditioning. So taken together, our data suggests that potentiation in Purkinje cells is in fact essential for cerebellar motor learning and if you look at the severity of the behavioral phenotypes, we even think that it may be one of the, if not the main mechanism underlying cerebral motor learning.